Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 154 for Monday, February 19th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you, Mr. Kent? Pretty good, Mr. Hamilton. How are you feeling now? Um, you know, better than last week. Not as good as I would like to. So, so that is was a pretty good fall. I mean, if it's taking you this long to kind of start feeling better, that you really you really wrenched yourself. Uh, yeah, it really it wasn't the fall. It was that fateful stretch that I did like two uh, days afterwards. Yeah, I, I um, you know, I got this app for my iPad that that like lets you it's a 3d thing and it lets you deconstruct the human body because i wanted to see like all right what what is it that hurts what do i think i did and uh i think when i when i stretched it like i felt a pop i mean we all heard a pop in the room it was really loud and that was my rib kind of popping back into place but um but i think when i did that one of my intercostal muscles which is the which are the muscles between your ribs like either was being stretched by that out of place rib and was like happier that way, or it got like jarred or something because that muscle has been in a cramp for, you know, like a week and a half now. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's just taken time. Maybe it's way better now. I usually don't have to lift my leg off the floor when I cough now. So that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was joking. <laughs> I had and to cancel you're, a you're- Saturday night for that. So, Whoa. And it's only the second time ever for like health reasons. One was a fling gig we had right after I had either sprained or broken my wrist. We're like the jury's still out on that. And that was years ago. Um, or and then and then this one. And, you know, I probably could have done it. It was an acoustic gig with Amanda Saturday night. But Saturday was the first day that I was feeling like even remotely mobile and yeah. thought, you know, I don't want to go backwards with this. I've got a madhouse gig on Wednesday. And <laughs> how long did you deliberate? Um, I actually didn't deliberate much at all. I deliberated most of the day Thursday and decided if I woke up feeling like mobile and good on Friday, then maybe I would do the gig Saturday. But if Friday was not like I wanted to have a full day of feeling like I could do the gig before I actually, you know, decided to do the gig. And so I knew Friday. Like, OK, I'm not there and you, yet. And you told them Friday. Yeah, I told I had told Amanda, you know, much earlier in the week. And uh, and she was like, yeah, OK, right. But she but, has an easy, uh, easy second call. She does. It was going to be three of us. So she just said, well, I'll, the spot's yours if you want it even last minute, you, you know, but um, I'll do it as a duo instead of a, a trio. And, and that would. Be yeah. Fun. Yeah. So, it, you know, and I did text with her on Saturday afternoon and was like, yeah, I'm feeling good. But, you know, we've got this madhouse thing on Wednesday. And she's like, yeah, you can't do the. I'm not letting you do the gig tonight. I'm like, right. No, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So but uh your next weekend, you're anticipating you'll be back in form. Um, I'm hoping by by tomorrow. I have a rehearsal tomorrow, and then a Madhouse performance on Wednesday. So let's uh, mm. let's see where we go. Yeah, I mean, I did. I loaded my drums in to the the theater yesterday evening, uh, and I had my son help me with the heavy stuff, uh, which was good. But um, but you know, moving around like it it's sore, but but I'm functional as opposed to a week ago when it was like just non functional. Which yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. I'm going to be so, doing a lot of core exercises from now forward to to mitigate against this ever happening again. Well, I mean, well, is that going to help? I mean, again, yeah. you fall and then you stretch. So you're saying if your core was stronger when you did that fateful stretch, you wouldn't have uh, y- your core would have been strong enough to hold the muscles in place and it wouldn't have been a problem. Potentially. Yes. Yeah. 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 Seems like all of like. Not to get too far down the 
weird path here, but it seems like much of fitness now is about core training. Like it's very, yeah. not as much about bodybuilding. It's not as much about muscle development. A lot of it is all about balance and core and strong core. Everything emanates from a strong core. So I guess no matter what age you are, the premise of that seems to make a lot of sense. It does. And, I, and I've always kind of paid attention to that, but I think I'm, I'm going to pay even closer attention because I, sure. don't, I don't even want this to happen once every 10 years. Like I, yeah. I don't ever want to go through this. I've never... This has been really life changing in in terms of just perspective. Like I, I never imagined that it could be this bad. And my guess is it could be worse, right? I, I mean, I don't think I experienced the worst possible. So, yeah, but it's not a contest. You don't, not, you don't get a don't, prize for worse. I don't want. I don't want the prize. <laughs> you don't want a first prize. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. All right. We'll get better. And, you know, get that core good and get ready to get back in action. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. Good. House Rockers play Saturday night. We have this club about 45 minutes from here that I've, I've talked about several times called Main Street Brewery. And we've uh, we just turned it into a thing. And it's if I had four more of those around the Bay Area, I, you know, I would think we really got some place, you know, but this is like we play there every six to eight weeks. I'm always surprised. I mean, it's basically a line out the door and, and, uh, and, you know, it's a packed club and, uh, we've developed it, you know, we've been playing there for 14 years. Um, and it's been that way for about the last three or four years. So, you know, good crowds, sometimes great crowds, never a bad crowd, but it's been consistently like clearly people are marking it on their calendar. And the funny thing is like on our Facebook, I don't have that many, I can't identify the people in Pleasanton. So it's only the people that's the town. Um, I can only invite the people who I know live out there when I'm trying to target out there that are, you know, that are you know, personal friends or, you know, something like that. Um, but it is just so remarkable to me because I always think, you know, the thing about a cover band is it's a, it's an issue of convenience. Are the you know, are we doing anything this weekend? Are the kids doing anything this weekend? Right. And, you know, by Thursday of the week, you know, if you're free and, you know, sometimes maybe for singles, they're planning group outings or something like that. But even at that, you know, I always think it's maybe a week's notice at most, not many weeks out. But you know, it sure seems like people are circling the, our dates there on their calendar and coming out in droves. And it's really, it's really a cool thing. And like I said, all we did was just play our butts off there for many years, yeah. and and we developed something. But we play our butts off wherever we are. I was just going to say that's no different, right? Right. But but for some reason, it, it, we took hold in this place better, you know, to a greater degree, more impact than we have in some other places. And, uh, you know, it's always a good night there. I mean, place is full, you know, people, people plan birthday parties around coming to see us. Oh, that's cool. All these types of things. Yeah. I mean, and again, what's different there? I mean, I, I, I can't even deconstruct, you know, right, right. Demographic, maybe, you know, perfect demographic, maybe could you know, be, I don't know. It could be. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's that, that, uh, beautiful sort of synchronicity between what you play and what that club tends to draw in terms of clientele and, yeah. and right, because that's a lot of it, right? Y you know, you can play anywhere and in theory, the right clientele could come anywhere to see the right band, even if it's the wrong place. Like even if they would never go there on any other night, if you're playing there and the right people come, it could be great. But the chances of that happening randomly are pretty much nil. So, yep. you know, it sounds like maybe you you found a place that had exactly the stars you know, self-selected clientele that just magically fit. And that's great. I mean, what would be really great is if the either the owner or the booking manager, whoever it is that makes these decisions at the club, like if they recognized that and like that would give them a lot of credit for that. Now, I don't know if that's what happened, but in theory, that's what you hope a good booking manager does is understand nah. what they bring to the equation. Yeah, no, 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 no. Say, same as most places. The yeah, booking manager is like, you know, we, we got our way in there and you keep your spot as long as you at least, you know, make your make your money and make his customers happy. Yeah. And then but now it's turned into something. And, you know he's way nicer to us and he offers us some more gigs. And when I can't take gigs that he offers us, he's really disappointed. So, you know, in that, in that never ending game of leverage, you know, for example, I won't book there in December cause I try and keep all the weekends open for corporate stuff. Sure. He was like, he was like, Hey, you know, I'd love to get you in here some more. Right. So, which is very flattering and, you know, really cool. But, um, you know, it's just an indication that, uh, clearly, and this is a pretty stoic guy. So, you know, clearly he's seeing that something unique happens when we come there and, 
and and uh, he wants to make more money, and so he wants us to do a little bit more. Well, so, he should start uh, thinking about. He should be having this exact conversation, uh, right? I mean, for his own business. And figure yeah. out, OK, why do the house rockers work here and what other bands are there that I could, you know, bring in that are that would do the same thing here. Right. I mean, yep. that would that would be a smart business move, I would think. But, you know, what else? You think you would think. Yeah, you would think Yeah, you yeah. said something interesting, though, um, about Facebook ads and, and you know, like inviting people to events and all that. I've I've I think about this stuff a lot and. I've been starting to think that maybe, you know, I publish the event on, you know, your band's website or whatever and share it out there and do all that stuff whenever the gig comes in. Like, just have it on your events page because it's good in case somebody happens to stumble on it. But in terms of the actual, like, person to person invites where you take that event and and invite people to it, I'm starting to think that, like. 24 hours before the gig might even be too far out to start inviting people. Um, I mean, there are some that will plan it for weeks, right? But like you said, especially the demographics that, that you and I are in, and then therefore are generally the demographics of the people that we would play for, you know, it's like they don't know their schedule. The weekends are always sort of in flux. And if you can just at the last minute, throw them a great idea. You're not going to get everybody, but you're not going to get everybody anyway. But if you throw that idea right in front of them and they're like, yeah, we don't have anything to do tonight. And then boom, that invite comes in. Oh, let's do that. Perfect. Well, I'd say this. Um, I'd say of my, let's just use either Facebook or, or my emailing list. So sure. I have about 2000 email names and I have about 2,500 opt in, you know, people said, put me on your list mm -hmm. and I have about 2,500 Facebook people. Yep. I'd say somewhere less than 10% are the hardcore followers who want to know where we are and, you know, we'll plan around us. Right. I would say 90% are kind of like the, you know, what's going on this weekend. Oh, the house rockers are here and uh, you know, you want to go, want to go. And so it's the week of, so, yeah. you know, I, I think I've shared this before. I, I generally, I let, I let, I leave the weekends alone Monday. I say, Hey, this coming weekend, this is happening. Do one reminder on a Wednesday or Thursday. And then definitely on the Friday, tomorrow night, you know, yeah. and that's, that's, that's the, the basic thing. So when I, when yeah, I create I an think event, Monday is too soon. To, to like start pestering people about it. Uh, My only thought, and it's a really fascinating discussion. My only thought is people are kind of fresh out of the weekend. Like, oh, I love last weekend. What's, you know, and they, yeah. they, you know, some people will have a perspective of living for the weekend. Right. And they totally. know that there's a birthday party coming up or there, you know, there's some, you know, friends or you had such a good time last weekend. Let's do it again next weekend. So for some people, yep. I think that that Monday oh. notification resonates. Right. But with Facebook, you get one opportunity to invite a person to a uh. an event. Right. And so my thought is I do that on the Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. You do that closer to the gig. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so for, and for me, so the house rockers have like 2,500, you know, Facebook people. And I don't really understand the, the, the metrics of like when I, when you create an event, I guess if you follow, right. If you've opted to actually follow, you're prioritizing something like that. Right. Yeah. But they probably, uh, they probably won't see it anyway, unless they're like actively boom. doing that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then there's, then I post it to the, to the house rockers page. And so then you know, that's another opportunity, but then I also will post it on my personal page, which, you know, there's a lot of crossover because I invite a lot of my friends over to, you know, like the house rockers and a lot of people who like the house rockers, you know, ask to be my friend. So there's a, you know, like cross reference and that's basically what I do. I, I still, you know, it's not all passive. I mean, some people actively wear the house rockers this weekend, right? Sure. I mean, it's, it's not all whether it appears in your newsfeed, they either go to my website or yeah, they, they go choose. to our Facebook event page. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, they're seeking it out. So that's, that's my formula. You know, there's, there's, I post, I create the events about a month in advance and then I start doing the notifications. And the, like you said, I do the invites the middle of the week of the week, you know, yeah. Wednesday or Thursday for a, for a Saturday night show. I think that's the right way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I actually don't, I don't do invites when we don't have, um, when we don't have any responsibility for the draw. So, so just to try and not bombard people all the time, 
I don't do invites when we don't have responsibility for the draw or we're not like we're not taking the door or something like that where, you know, it's, it's not on us. Uh, so a lot of these summer things that are free and, you know, that type of stuff, um, you know, I don't do invites too much during the summer yep. um, to, just to try and stay out of people's face. And then, you know, when something special comes along, I'll do it a little bit heavier and just a little bit more often. So I don't know. I think that's it, no, I think that I, I, I think that's a very smart way of doing things. It's a. It's a way that you've clearly learned over time that that yeah. that works. I just, but yeah, I'm always questioning else. whether. Right. Yeah, I'm just questioning whether it's just habit or or whether it really works. It just it dawn the logic dawns on me as being smart, but yes. you know, is it the most effective thing? I mean, you know, I I definitely. I notice when other bands in the area sponsor, that's the other thing we haven't talked about is when do you pay to, you know, to kind of push, make sure it gets into people's news feeds. Um, you know, there, that I do for special events, I'll do that. Or for something again, where I really, you know, new venue and a new geography, I'll do that or, you know, that type of thing. So that's the other component of it. When do you actually augment what Facebook will do for you organically? Yeah. I, I think that's more about, branding than it is about actually converting people in the moment. Well, we've talked about that and and that, you know, that, that dollar for dollar, it's kind of hard to tell, but I will say, and again, there's a band, a local band here and they have a gig. It's a a first time gig in a new place. And they've shown up in my newsfeed as a sponsored post often. I mean, Uh enough that I am very aware that a good for them, you know, they're doing marketing B I'm very aware of their gig. Um, it's just there almost every time I look. So, um, they, they've done a good job, but that, that's, that's um, what I'm saying is it's great for branding because you know their name. And so when they come up or you have a free night or whatever, it's like, Oh yeah, I should go to that. But I, I don't right. think that draws people. It's not going to pour people in the door at your gig, no matter how much yeah. you throw at that. I really, I, I just don't think that's not how advertising works. That's not how the human yeah. brain works. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, I know what I was going to say to you. So we're talking about your health. I'm going to bounce back to that a little bit. So, sure. um, so I made a decision that I was way too heavy last summer, last couple of summers. And so I actually started, um, December 18th. I, my thinking I was going to lose weight and get into much better shape for this summer's tour. Right in the middle and, of the um, holidays is a great time well, to that's do it. that. Yep. And, well, I, what I said was if I can do it during the holidays, it'll be cake after the holidays. That was the thinking. Sure. And, uh, it was hard during the holidays. I mean, you think of everything that's going on and you know, my wife's a great cook and, yeah, and it was really, really hard. That, you and I are, and I'm using air quotes here, cursed with having uh, <laughs> women in our lives, wives who yes. are fantastic cooks. Yes. Yep. And I have had the, had the but, uh, pleasure of experiencing your wife's cooking. I, I, I can't speak highly enough of it. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> she, no, she is an awesome cook and she loves to cook and she loves to entertain. Uh, so, you know, there's just food and great food around all the time. So anyway, my weight goes up and down in about three year cycles, too. So, you know, it's, it's up for too long. And I'm only bringing this up and being reasonably transparent about this because, you know, it smacks me in the head. A, I'm getting older and I'd like. I'd like to be healthy and I'd like to live longer. So I better start figuring some stuff out. B, I stand in the middle front of the stage of a pretty good band and I should really be aware of, uh, the responsibility of that. And I'm not trying to be too, too holier holier than thou about this, but you know, we, I, I, I rave rage about, you know, wanting my band to dress well. And if I can't take myself seriously enough, so I, I kind of really looked in the mirror and said, dude, you got to walk the walk. And so yeah. I've actually, so I'm down about 10, so 20 pounds over the past two months. Wow. And uh, you know, you know, like once you get about three weeks and again, three weeks of, of saying no to, to holiday food, it's not quite as hard. I mean, it's not, it's not never a pleasure and I miss the hell out of pizza, but, but, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, now it's just more like food is fuel, you know, and, you know, there's occasional temptation, that type of thing. Sure. But mostly the reason I bring this up is it was that moment. Health was the number one thing. I wasn't feeling great and I want to feel great and I want to you know be active and those types of things. But I, you know, the vanity part of it is I'm standing front and sta- center on a stage in front of, you know, a thousand people every now and then I really should demonstrate a commitment that that's part of commitment to my craft. Yep. Uh, and, you know, be a little bit more pleasant to observe as I'm doing my thing. Not that heavy guys can't be pleasant, but, you know, I, I kind of feel like, uh, you know, 
B.B. King was quite pleasant, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he did Meatloaf. fairly well for himself, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think he I think he had a future. Um, anyway, uh, so that's, you know, another health thing. So core exercises, but I'm actually I've taken weight loss pretty seriously over the past couple of months. And I'm not I'm not where I want to be yet. So um, it's still an ongoing process. And a little bit of this sharing this is a little bit selfish you know, to try and be, hold myself accountable now that I've just told some accountability. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you lead a band, part of leading the band is like inspiring people to, you know, get your vibe. And if you look unhealthy, um, I think it's, uh, just another barrier to communicating your truth in, in whatever music you're trying to play. And so that's, that's all my thinking about it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not railing on anybody. I'm not, I'm not preaching anybody. It's just just you. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, health to both of us. Health to both of us, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's awesome. I'm glad yeah. Hey, friend. have you heard this, uh, the funny stuff coming out of NBA all-star game yesterday and, uh, and, uh, Fergie's rendition of the national anthem. Uh, I saw brief oh. posts about this, but I did not, I'm not a basketball fan. And so no, I, I'm, I, this, what you just said is more than I knew uh, already. Oh so. man. Oh man, dude, I don't, the, the, it was an extremely strange, uh, she was going for arty, artsy, but it, you know, it missed by so far. It is so painfully obvious. And the funny thing is I'm thinking about her rehearsing this and nobody in her trusted circle of advisors waving a red flag to her, you know, or, or saying don't do it. Cause it is so far off the mark. I mean, I'm oh, man. So good. No, no, it's really crazy. I mean, someone, someone I know brought up Roseanne Barr doing this at a baseball game. And I, and I think Roseanne Barr was being a comedian when she was doing that and thought she had the artistic license to do that with the, with the anthem. But, um, this was a, you know, a serious singer who actually has some chops probably. I mean, I'm not a big black eyed peas or Fergie fan, but, but, um, you know, she certainly had some hits and, you know, she gets, she gets hit making to, to some degree, but man, how someone could be that far off is just a crazy thing. That's bad. I, I, now I almost kind of have to watch it. Oh, you got to watch it. We play, um, Tower of Power Horns did the national anthem at a San Francisco Giants game and, and our, uh, arranger, John Hassan, a uh, cop that and wrote a, a horn arrangement for the, um, for the anthem and people really like it. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's Tower of Power. So there's a couple of like riffs to it, but sure. in general, it's just a nice full horn section. And it's just, it's very, and again, the word respectful is a little bit weird because, you know, she, I don't think she was trying to be disrespectful. I think she was trying to be artsy, but yeah, it so went he, so you know, far here's, away. Here's the thing about the national anthem. And I, I, I suppose we as a people have gotten very, very far away from this. So, so maybe it doesn't matter anymore. But um, when I was in high school, you know, we would play the national anthem before all of our games in the, in the marching band or whatever, you know, we played it all the time. And uh, I remember our, our band director, you know, very early on told us, look, the national anthem is you're not supposed to applaud the performance of it because you don't want to make a big deal out of the people who performed it. The song is supposed to stand on its own. So we're not going to do anything different. We're not going to improvise. We're just going to play this and don't expect anyone to applaud. They will because it's what we do as a people, but it's not about you. And I always took that to heart. Like, yeah, that right. That's how that song should be. And, and, you know, I wind up, uh, we have season tickets for the the University of New Hampshire hockey team here. Uh-huh. And, you know, so there's always somebody different singing the national anthem before the games. And the ones that are the best are the people that just come out and sing it straight. Uh, yeah. It's not an easy song to sing. Like it's, in fact, an awful melody to have to sing. The yeah. range required and all that. And I'm always just impressed when somebody comes out, does it and walks out. That's it. It's all you need. No riff. Yeah. So John. Nothing. So John wrote this arrangement, A, he's, a, he's got a military background and he's, you know, very much about respecting the performance of it. And, you know, and I learned, I've learned a lot from him about, you know, he, he's very, very, this is, this is serious stuff, you know, and from his background, it is very serious stuff. And yeah. so, um, it's respectful. I think, you know, the NBA is a, a large part about in some ways, 
moving cultural barriers, you know, there's like a, quite a bit of a, well, then they should just stop doing the national anthem. And, and I uh, don't say that to be, to be flip. I, I, it's weird that we do. And it's, in fact, it's the, the synchronicity of the timing of this on Saturday for whatever reason, I guess it was because we were at yet another hockey game for our son, where also they play the national anthem. And she was like, why do they do this at, at sporting events? Like, they don't do this at concerts where, you know, people get together and they're going to, you know, enjoy a shared experience. They don't do it anywhere else. Why do they do it here? So I looked it up and there's a post on Mental Floss that explains that it just happened during the seventh inning stretch of the 1918 World Series. It was the Cubs and the Red Sox playing. And uh, the they had... Um, I guess because of, uh, you know, World War One was happening, all that stuff. Uh, they had uh, people doing like military drills and bands playing patriotic songs. And so during this one game in Chicago, they played the Star Spangled Banner. Everybody sang along and it was great. So then when it came to Boston, they did the same thing. And then for a number of years, it was only there for like big, important games. They would play it before you know, like a World Series game or something. And then uh, I forget which president it was, but but somebody actually made it official that it was our national anthem. And it just became a habit that we played it before sporting events. Uh, but it was never like, you know, a thing that we had to do. It just sort of developed and, and it has stayed in the sporting world. It just hasn't grown beyond that. It's also worth mentioning that the melody for the national anthem, the words were written by Francis Scott Key, right? Well, where he was watching that that uh, battle at sea, but um, the, the melody was, it was it, like a friend of his realized, or maybe it was his brother realized that the words would fit perfectly with this drinking song that they had called <laughs> to Anacreon in heaven. Uh, and, and that's, so that's the melody. We sing a drinking song as our nat national anthem, or at least a drinking melody. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> a little yeah. history lesson from Dave Hamilton. There you go. I, it's just weird that, I, yeah, I, this is the kind of trivia that interests me. So, yeah. That's in your head, for yeah. sure. Well, anyway, yeah, check it out, Dave, because, uh, you know, it's a crazy thing. And do you, have you ever had to, with your band, play either accompany someone for the national anthem or your rock band, you know, actually perform the national anthem? No, with, with the rock band, we've never done that. Um, I, I do remember a gig. It was several bands ago where we were at something. And so the national anthem had to be played and we just played a recording of it. And, you know, there were jokes about, well, we should play Hendrix's version or this. It's like, yeah, no, let's just find a instrumental version of a concert band playing it. And we'll just put that out there. I, what I find weird is when I go to like a youth hockey game or something and somebody pulls out, you know, if they're just going to play a recording of it, like they, this, this, uh, team in Rochester, New Hampshire, they pull out this weird, like totally riffed up. It sounds like a country singer. I don't know who it is that originally did it, but of all the versions of the national anthem that you could pick, it's just weird that they pick this one that's got like all these riffs and it, you know, it's all about the performer. It's like, yeah, it's kind of just weird. Just, it's, they're not. Well, there are a lot out there. I mean, yeah. Metallic and San Francisco Giants games, you know, I said Tower of Power. Metallica has played the national anthem. Mm. Huey Lewis and News have done an acapella, you know, yeah. like a doo-wop version of the national anthem. I mean, there are a lot of attempts to personalize the national anthem. Totally. But I think, I, I I think you're Fish, right at the end. I saw Fish do it when they played for the first time at Fenway Park. They came out before the show and stood on the pitcher's mound and, uh, and sang it acapella. It wasn't that great. I would imagine everybody who's ever asked to perform the national anthem has to go through this exercise in their head. Like, well, they're going to see my national anthem or... Or no, you just play it straight. You yeah. just get the job done. You right. Job done. And, and, right. and yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, unless you're Whitney, right. Right. Who, you know, unless you're, unless you're that amount of talent, sing it, you know, hold the money note at the end and, you know, get right. the, elicit the patriotic pride, but, you know, to try and affect the whole song, you're, you're, you're just, it's just not worth it, worth the risk. I don't think. I don't think so. I don't the think. hate that will come back with you if you don't pull it off. Yeah, so. Most people aren't. Yes, you'll get 
the the enthusiastic fans that will support you. The people that hate what you're doing to the national anthem will simply stay will quiet. Will hate you. But they will hate you, but they will stay yeah. quiet out of respect yeah. for the song. They're not going to make a big deal out of it in the moment. Now, it sounds like this yeah. thing sort of, you know, <laughs> social media, t- it sounds like might have taken Dude. over. Dude. I got to go see it. But uh, yeah. But, you know, don't think for a moment that just because you did all these riffs and you had somebody, you know, three people in the crowd cheering you on, that that was a win because it probably wasn't. Most people probably regretted having to listen to you do that to the song. That's my feeling. Yep, yeah. For sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, this gig I had Saturday night. So I was feeling a little bit of a twinge in my throat. A lot of people are sick out here. I went to the gig and I felt good during the gig and sang well during the gig. And, and you know, I felt good. And then, you know, I started to feel a little weird on the drive home, about a 45, 50 minute drive home. And I was pretty sick yesterday morning. I'm probably still sounding a little bit froggy now, yeah. but um, it's kind of weird. I, I wonder if, I wonder if something's coming on, adrenaline keeps it away. And then, you know, the letdown at the end of a, a hard night is, uh, you know, it lets it all in and, and fester because I was definitely clogged up you know, feverish. And, you know, my throat was, I, I can sing those shows and I sing them all the time and never pay a fatigue price on it. But my throat was definitely huh. not my throat. Like, like more, there's just stuff down there. It's not, I wasn't yeah. hoarse. Right. But, um, yeah, yeah. I, I've experienced that. If, if I'm, if I feel like something's coming on on the day of a gig, the next day is it's either gone, like going to the gig and sweating through it and all that stuff can be, totally healing, right? It just, whatever it is, we're just going to cook it out or I get exactly what you're talking about. And by the time I get home, it's like, Oh, I'm going to pay for this. You know? Yeah. 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 That's just how it goes. I, I think when, the, you know, surviving the winter of gigs, you have to kind of be pretty vigilant about keeping your health up. Uh, yeah. And even at that, you can't keep everything away. No, you can't. That's right. But the good news is, you know, they're all viruses, which means once you get one of them, you don't get that version again. So that's uh, right. right. I mean, cool. so as we get older, there's less we're susceptible to less and less in terms of those colds, which is good. Well, that's yes. good. Yeah. Hey, Dave. Hey, so I think Paul. you and I I think you and I have personally um, put the kibosh on uh, on Gibson Guitar Company. I heard yeah. So we talked last week about cool alternates to the known name brands. And, you know, we got on our Facebook page, a little love from heritage. And, you know, I know the Godan guys looked at us and I, and, uh, and the um, Eastman guys looked at our, you know, liked our page. Yeah. So we're talking about all these optional, you know, alternative guitar brands. And then a couple hours later, you know, news starts to be spreading that Gibson's on the verge of Gibson's chapter 11 on the block. That's it's right. All, it's all us, man. It's we our did. fault. <laughs> <laughs> if only get Gab 153 had never happened. That's right. If only. So <laughs> apologies to the good people at Gibson. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of mixed feelings. That is an, that is iconic. It's an iconic guitar. It's an iconic American brand. It's an iconic rock and roll brand. I, I you know I hope that there's some way that someone figures out how to how to write that ship because, you know I think it's, you know, slash with with a uh, an alternate brand guitar would seem a little odd to me right I huh. think I think icons are good when it comes to something like rock and roll. So here's the thing though is I saw that and and I'm not you know a guitar player right but uh, as I saw that I started to wonder well. We put so much priority and we hold such a value for these vintage guitars, right? That what percentage of new players going out and buying guitars or even existing players going out and buying guitars, what percentage of those are on the vintage market versus on the new market? And is it, it like, cause there were all these articles like rock and roll is dead. It's like, well, you know, I look around and I don't, I don't think so, but maybe sure. But is it that there's just like the market saturated with guitars and we actually place value on the older ones. So the newer ones are seen as not as important. Like, is that, I think it's just, a, I think somewhere? it's just a dynamic. No, I think, I think markets change, right? So yeah. you, know, you and I with our business hats on markets change and, you know, the opportunity for brands to come in at different price points and different feature sets. That's just how markets work. Right. So mm-hmm. someone says, Hey, you know, not everybody has the money for the top end. So let's get real competitive in the middle and let's get, let's, you know, be more creative 
feature wise at the at the entry level. And so, you know, that's that's something that markets do. Yeah. And then market leaders have to adapt to that. Right. I mean, that's just every it's just how every goes. industry and it's just how it goes. And so, you know, the Gibson brand is worth a lot of money. It means a lot. It has a lot of recognition. I mean, there's a lot there that that is is of value. So, you know, do they cut production? Do they, you know, start getting really innovative with features, right? Do they, you know, you expect a market leader to lead. So, you know, Gibson has been largely about its same models and retrenching on its same models year in and year out. Maybe that, maybe that formula for, for instrument manufacturers changes. You know, once you have someone trust your brand, do you have to come out with a Les Paul every year, Right. Right. Is it, you know, is there something to learn from how technology companies release computers or, 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 you know, well, consumer it's electronics? The same thing. That's right. Yep. So, you know, but mostly you, you, we could all agree the Gibson brand is a value. It's a well regarded brand for well made instruments and it represents the top of the market. So, you know, it, it, you'd hate to see it go away. You'd like to think that, you know, someone will come in and, say, well, look, this brand is too good. We're going to have to change the way we do things and we'll have to be smart about it. But, um, you know, there's something there. Yeah, they need, they need they, a, a turnaround CEO or something like that to, to just exactly. and, and fix it up. Yeah, but but I think, like you said, it's got to be somebody that's coming in totally eyes wide open who realizes that, you know, even 20 or 30 years ago, if you took the top, you know, whatever, 10 guitarists, it, at least half of them were playing Gibsons, right? And and, For sure. and and then the other half were playing like Strats from Fender. But now you take the top 10 guitars, you, there might be 10 different brands represented there. For sure. And some of them are tiny little brands where it's one guy in his house that makes these guitars and isn't interested in getting any bigger. So the chances of you as a, a you know, a, 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 I'll call us all nobodies, right? You, you know, you, someone without... Uh, and in the ability to get a, a true endorsement or anything, you're not going to be able to move to the front of the line for that guy. Right. You know, right. like, like, um, like uh, Trey Anastasio from fish, right. He's respected amongst guitar players. He plays custom built guitars by their old sound man, Paul Languedoc. And the guy's getting older. His company makes a fixed amount of guitars per year that doesn't change. And if you get on that list, you might get a guitar someday, Sure, but that's it. Like that's the only guarantee you get is, I might call you with a guitar for you someday. Yeah. That's it. You know, so you can't even like a lot of these guys, you can't even emulate as a young player or, you know, as, uh, as a fan, you can't even emulate that because it's like, well, I got to go buy somebody that makes a guitar sort of like that. Right. And now you're not even in name brands anymore. And that's okay. Like, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make is name brands don't matter as much now as they used to. Well, um, there's, I have a few thoughts. So as a guy who loves guitars yeah. and has quite a few guitars, you know, there's a couple of things I still, if there's a, if there's an artist, um, uh, recommended model. So, you know, like I have a John Mayer Martin acoustic, right. Sure. That model, you know, again, I still see my heroes and the tone they have, and I'm still a sucker for those. And I have several of those, um, um, you know, artist signature series guitars, you know, I, I still love them and I still think, you know, the great artists that I grew up listening to, I know what guitar they played and, you know, how iconic that is. And I'm still, that means something to me. So purchasing one of the guitars, you know, Tom Petty Rickenbacker or, uh, you know, uh, John Mayer Martin or, or, you know, I have a John Lennon Rickenbacker. Just to you be know. fair, John Mayer went to my high school after, long after I graduated. So, <laughs> so we may not have grown up listening to him if we're going to accept time as a linear construct for, for this episode. That's all. I, 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 yeah, I, I'm talking about heroes though, I right? You. No, so. of course. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's one aspect of buying guitars for me. Um, but buying a guitar is, uh, you know, it, it is a statement of your personal brand. Some people want to mm -hmm. demonstrate their individuality and have a guitar nobody else has. Some people want to pay homage to, you know, someone who's influenced them and you want to buy the same guitar that your hero has played. I mean, there's all sorts of really cool. And I get this. I mean, this is. I don't know why the heck I buy a lot of other things. I used to think a lot about why people bought Apple stuff. And I, you know, the whole gestalt of, of, you know, how a brand gets into your head and, you know, gets into your, into your soul and grabs you and makes you want something because of the brand, because of, you know, why people buy Nike shoes, you know, for the swish, they have to, that's part of who they see themselves as. Sure. There's a lot of same reasons that go into this like psychology of buying guitars. Totally. There is always still 
a need for the top end of the market. You know, there's, you know, that maybe you can't afford it, but you aspire to afford it. And so with regards to Gibson, my sincere hope is somebody finds that, you know, brand value and says, we just need to figure out a different way to do this. It was funny that, um, the nice folks from heritage who, um, who commented, I think they invited you to come tour the factory. Yep. They're actually in Gibson's old factory in, uh-huh. in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That's funny. <laughs> so serendipity, the story continues, but That's anyway, funny. so, you know, I personally, I wish the folks at Gibson very well. And I hope that there's a, you know, a Gibson brand out there for people to enjoy for a long, long time. It's Even though I love other guitars, Gibson is one of them. You said about the top of the, you know, the top of the market's always needed. And I actually, I fully agree with that. But if we take, you know, the, the piece of advice that we gave or the thought that we gave, you know, five minutes ago, that maybe the guitar industry needs to take a lesson from the technology industry. And then we go to Apple. There are a lot of people out there like Apple makes their Mac pro, right? And there are a lot of people out there that are Mac pro users and diehards that are really upset that Apple hasn't updated the Mac Pro yet. They say that that's coming this year for those of you that care about that side of things. But we haven't, other than a loose promise, we haven't seen anything from them for that. <laughs> and, and that's, but you know, but and and what it is, is these product cycles no longer is it every year is the top of the line updated. It's maybe, you know, even in technology, it's once every, what, five years? Right. That's pretty slow. And with guitars, I feel like that could be once every 10 years, maybe. I mean, I realize guitars are also part of the technology industry in, in their own way. So maybe five years is the right thing. But is that enough to maintain interest and and then a factory that's actually making these things and all of that? Like it like I, and perhaps that's what somebody walking into Gibson as their turnaround CEO needs to ask those questions. Like, well, okay. I, what I would say is they clearly need to um, create a Gibson world expo and have me come and, you know, build it and, and, uh, and execute it. And that would change everything in a minute. I think you should be the new CEO of Gibson. I think you're Thank the you turnaround did. guy. I I'm the man for the job. Paul Kent turnaround CEO Gibson guitar. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> There you go. Yep. Yep. I'll make sure to, uh, I'll tag them in our Facebook post. I'm sure they'll see it and they'll be reaching out to you. There are people that uh, contact your people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's right. I got a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Dude. All right. Well, listen, keep healing. Cause I want to hear that you had a good gig this week and, uh, Same. house rockers are opening up a new venue. So they're about uh, 30 miles from here, a guy bought a theater, put a really nice sound system in it and, uh, and then a good lights, uh, system in it and we're going to go play there for the first time. So I'll report back on that next week. Oh, that sounds like fun. I always love it when people yep. do that. Most of the time, I hate to say this cause I'm going to sound like negative Nelly blame the pain folks. Uh, most of the time, those places just die right away. So, but they're usually really fun to play because people put too much money into them and then can't support it. But, uh, you know, there you go. Hopefully that's not the case yep. with this one. Uh, we, hope, up. we hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, that's what we got for this one. Uh, unless you got good, something good else. Good gig gabbing with you. It's no, I'm good. It's good gig gabbing with you, my friend. Yeah, fun, fun, fun. Hey, even if your back hurts this week, always be performing. That's the plan, man. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Take it easy, folks. Have a good week. See, we'll see ya. you next week. 